and on and on we go with one temp job after another and do my best I can. I can't do anything less than what I can do because I don't want to play the games I'm before God. So I went from Motorola one month. Well, in Iron Mountain, uh, one week I'm filing in a dark warehouse using a hospital filing system. I had to figure that out on rickety ladders, which could fall off with a left-handed layout. I was beginning to wonder if there was the same job out there that show, showed some respect for my humanity and intelligence. Motorola. I spent one month there repairing beepers. So we received instant training. Results looked pretty good at the beginning. I had a hard time getting up to speed, though. I'd not done work like this before. Some of my co-workers were pretty adept at meeting their daily quota, especially a young East Indian girl. She was very nice and helped me here and there. The supervisors were kind to me, and when I didn't make the cut, they kept me on until the light went on upstairs. I, it went on, and my production increased dramatically. I became the leader in my group until that fatal day. Somebody had just to show me how to do it, but nobody would, except that nice lady, the Eastern Indian girl. They brought in safety glasses to wear after four weeks of doing the work without them, but I needed glasses like I have now. We had to put them on that day, that moment, or be terminated. I did the best I could, but they, they wouldn't fit over my eyeglasses. I asked if they had standard safety goggles or if I could report tomorrow with them. I could go out and buy some. They said no, and I packed up my things to go on the road again. Greenwich, one day. All state, two days. I got there on time and waited for four hours for my supervisor to bring me into the office. She said she was real upset that her assistant broke her leg and deserted her with all the work she had to do. Why did she wait for four hours? I wondered why she kept me waiting for four hours if the workload was so high. I took out a pad as she rattled off instructions like a machine gun. She said I wasn't allowed to take notes. I insisted anyway, and she looked at me like a hungry Wattweiler. Once I started working, each question I had was a serious annoyance, but her instructions did not cover what I was asking her about. Her answers were mean-spirited and put the blame on me for her assistant's broken leg. Several questions later, I was dismissed and shown the door. More business forms for two months. I replaced a woman on maternity leave. She was one of the few trainers who gave detailed step-by-step -step instructions and allowed me to take notes. She was very kind and looked over my notes and made corrections wherever she skipped steps when instructing me. Most people skip important steps when they tell you how to do a job and then get impatient when you get stuck because of their poor instructions. The job was, was facilitated by her sweet, patient personality, so it went smoothly. She came back two months after, later after giving birth to a healthy baby girl. I learned more about importing files into Excel. The difficulty was that there was no desk for me to occupy nearby, so they put me in a utility computer printer room all by myself with a laptop. There was no real desk space in there either, only some small room between two printers where I scrunched my chair and my knees up to the table. I had no one to share my faith with until several people came in and were quite congenial. God sends people to you, I discerned, even if you are placed in a closet. I dressed up my reports that I sent out, and everyone was really impressed. Ironically, they hired a black female retired flight attendant who didn't know much about computers to replace me as soon as my supervisor came back after giving birth. Apparently, there was going to be a shift in duties. She became paranoid about everything I was doing because of the dressed-up reports and efficiency I brought to my daily tasks. I was willing to t train her, but she wasn't uh, willing. She tried several times to accuse me of errors that she had made. When I went back and printed out the evidence that it was her error, she became visibly upset. One day she became enraged because she said I was trying to show her up. Fortunately, it was my last day and the assignment ended well. The pattern continues. Someone who can't do the work as well as I have is usually my replacement. Carson Brooks, transcription from Dictating Machine. One day. Kelly Payroll, two months, part-time. Dating data entry upgrade. Had to find something with full-time hours. Tough to eat on part-time wages. The supervisor was nice enough to give me a pay raise, but it wasn't enough to survive on. Bank one, general office two months. The work was a piece of cake. Mostly simple data entry, some sorting and filing. I got the work done rapidly. 
so they gave me the time-consuming task of printing out signature cards when I was done with the regular work. It took four to five minutes to print each card because the computer system was so slow. So I went over to a location with three unoccupied PCs and turned them all on and started printing out a card every 30 seconds. That was fun, but it really freaked out a few folks. The assignment ended, but they transferred me over to another department. A really young lady started to train me, but she spoke a form of English that was so incomprehensible that I couldn't do the job. I don't think I heard a single verb, nor a single complete word spoken. I noticed that she spoke a little slower and more, more comprehensible dialect with others. It's a young thing. She didn't want me to work there. Repent or you will likewise perish. The job at Bank One was in downtown Dallas. I took the express commuter bus home from a park in Dallas every day. Every evening there were preachers in the park yelling out their theology, telling me, telling everyone to repent or perish in hell. I hesitated to come up to any of them because they were so vociferous. They didn't invite conversation. There was no eye contact. I wondered what they thought they were doing. Everyone was going to hell. We were all filthy sinners. One evening a man came with a board strapped in front and back telling me to repent. He came up to me and looked me in the eye and as I waited for the bus. He told me to repent. I, and I said, of what? He told me I was going to hell. I said, how do you know that? You don't know me. He got nose to nose with me and kept screaming his diatribe. I told him that repent means to change your mind and believe in Jesus, and I'd already done that when I was 17. I felt a hand on my shoulder as the preacher's breath blew on my face. I turned to see a huge Dallas City policeman. He told me to stop talking to the preacher. He explained that these preachers get a permit and do their thing in the park, and that dialogue with them usually led to violence. So he was there to keep the peace. He said if I responded again, I was going to jail. I obeyed and went home a free man. That night I did a study on the word repent, showing that it meant to change your mind and believe in Jesus to save you from your sins. The next evening I attached it to the top of the nearby newspaper stand in the park. The newspaper news policeman on duty was watching everyone. It worked. The preacher got my study, but it only served to enrage him further. His points were insane and illogical. I walked to the back of the area to get out of earshot of the policeman. The preacher followed me back and I stopped near his wife and son and turned to ask his wife a question. That seemed to diffuse him for the moment. The disciples asked Jesus, What must we do to do the work God requires for eternal life? In John chapter 6, I said. And do you know what Jesus answered was? And the pastor remained silent, permitting his wife to answer. She asked to be baptized. I said, No. I said, Jesus said, The work of God for eternal life is this, to believe in the one he has sent. That's it. That's all he said to them. It's simply a moment of faith alone in Christ alone. There was a pause. It seemed I had taken the breath away from everyone around me. I walked back to the bus stop and the preacher followed. His nose touched mine as he yelled at the top of his lungs that the same old condemnation to hell story, completely ignoring what I had just said. He got so close I could feel his board touch my knees and his breath on my face. The bus came as the policeman started walking over to us. Thereafter, I walked to another street and picked up the bus before the park. I decided I'd made my point and did not need a night in jail to emphasize the message. National auto funding, two months. I was diligent, and a two-week assignment was stretched to two months so I could do some spreadsheet work for several of the salesmen. Then a young lady requested my assistance doing phone work. She micromanaged my every word and ran me off. Steel cases for the birds one day. One day. Three of us were sent to the do housework, uh, warehouse work. We were a constant annoyance to our supervisor. We worked well together and too fast. We came over to him for more work. He told us to get lost in an unfriendly way. He came over and yelled, What are you guys doing hanging around back here? Get busy. I asked him for something else to do. He gave us something we would finish in ten minutes. This was the pattern till lunchtime. One of our crew took us a one-way trip to lunch. No point putting up with this, he said on the way out. I asked the supervisor, where's the break room? He said, you won't be able to go there. you got to go somewhere else. So I went to a corner of the warehouse and found an old dusty table with three legs and an attack bird. A couple of boxes, quick dusting, and a crate to sit on, and I was good to go. The view overlooked the window looking into the break room. It was large, clean, uncrowded, and had a soda machine full of tables and chairs. A bird swooped down on my head. 
It kept at it every 20 minutes, every 20 seconds, banging into the window above. I wondered why it never found its way out of the big bay doors. Thought I'd test the edict to stay out of the break room. So I went through the break room door and headed to the soda machine. He was waiting for me like a gunslinger at high noon. I told you, you can't come in here. I'm just getting a soda pop, Barton, I said. Well, hurry it up on and get, he said. Soda in hand, I departed the break room, walked through the Warbirds territory and went outside. I ate my lunch on the back stairway. After lunch, I took my partner's cue and excused myself and joined the ranks of the unemployed. Skyway freight for two days. Several trucks had electronics gear jammed to the doors, all hand-loaded, so it had to be uploaded by hand. One young temp kept throwing monitors in the air to me instead of handling to, handing them to me. If I dropped one of it, it was my paycheck. Manage, management solved that problem quickly, fired all of us. CBC copying two days. First plus mortgage, filing two months. There were dozens of boxes to open up and millions of papers to file. Sorting was an unknown commodity. Everyone just filed one paper at a time. I just started sorting like a good little temp. Everyone followed suit and production increased geometrically. The manager encouraged me, but the supervisor kicked the sorting boxes, the piles, onto the floor in a snow flurry of paper. I found some carts with compartments in them and used them to sort. The work started to progress like we might even finish in this century. There were several on our crew who chose not to sort, and some chose not to work at all. One guy always seemed to disappear when he showed up and reappear when it was time to go home. I had some filing to do one day in the back row and found him under a pile of papers, checking his eyelids for holes. He was sleeping. He just put himself up underneath a bunch of papers and hid until it was quitting time. I figured the manager would discover this sooner or later, and he did. The paid nap ceased when he stumbled out the door and never came back. A woman had a better idea. She picked up a paper and brought it to the back row and started at it all day, so it looked like she was working. Her only problem was that she kept talking to the paper. She had a sad story about her son dying in jail while she read her Bible and determined that reading the Bible too much was the cause of the death. When she discovered I read my Bible every day, she threatened to kill me. The work was approaching completion, so I decided that discretion was the better part of valor, especially with the hostile tone the workplace was taking. I was beginning to enjoy firing myself. The Associates. Data Entry. Two Months. Last chance to make good at the associates. Cindy was just about due for delivery. We worked well together in a tiny cramped office. I brought boxes of work in for the expectant mom so she didn't have anything to lift. She was a patient teacher. I discovered a shortcut macro that speeded up the entry process. My supervisor had me train all the others on the macro thing. Work went well with everyone. Cindy went on, Cindy went on to a maternity leave and in came Country Girl. Country Girl Temp was brought in to replace Cindy. She took over everything in our little office. Things went south when I decided not to join her for lunch that first day. She had trouble getting around with her spike heels and petticoat dresses. So she demanded I cease bringing in boxes of work to do. I could only bring in an armful of files at a time now. So she insisted on playing continuous country music loud. When I turned down her radio when she wasn't working in the office, she went ballistic and complained I was touching her personal property. She was on medication for carpal tunnel syndrome in both arms. Her doctor said no keyboard work, yet she took work off my desk and keyed it in anyway instead of doing the filing. She had periodic emotional flare-ups associated with the pain in her arms because she kept on typing. More on this later. later.